Chapter 24 Inferno June 28th, 2086 Arcadia Bay, Oregon Over 70 years ago, this coastal town was destroyed by a tornado. Now it seemed the spirit of destruction had returned. Soldiers of the United Nations Army and the progeny clashed in vicious fashion, lighting up the dark night with powerful weapons. Near the lighthouse point, a rotary plasma cannon spat green bolts into the air, forcing a starfighter to break off its strafing run and seek cover among the nearby mountains. Down in the city ruins, a confused melee erupted as highly trained UN troops descended upon panicking thralls. And in the midst of it all, the Stormbreakers somehow managed to find one another. Fighting their way past two factions of enemies, Varian, Nainu, Quarter, Kingi, Setla, and Maui found one another just outside the wreckage of Blackwell Academy. Taking shelter in the hulk of a former school bus, the team only had a few moments to regroup. Hyatt's troops are attacking downhill from Lighthouse Point, Quarter reported. Freeman's men are attacking from the school, Maui added. They're massing near Tobanga Trail. That's where we need to go, Nainu said. Whatever is at the end of that trail is too important to let either side have. I agree with Nainu, Varian said. Do we just go as we are? Should we get the Niagara? No way, Settler replied. The progeny have deployed anti-aircraft weapons. Leave the ship. We take whatever weapons and equipment we have now and take advantage of our enemy's distraction for as long as we can. Everyone agreed with Setla. On the count of three, the Stormbreakers broke from cover and started their advance towards the head of Tobanga Trail. All around them, the mass battle continued as progeny soldiers tried to displace UN defenders from Tobanga. Alien thralls, screaming in fear, charged UN positions while progeny acolytes gunned down those who hesitated. Let Hyatt and Freeman's men kill each other off as much as you can. Varian ordered. Use the chaos as cover. Setla was in his element. The gargantuan Mycor thundered through the battle space, picking up a small truck and throwing it into the academy courtyard for his comrades to use as cover. A group of progeny fighters spotted the Stormbreakers and turned to fight them. It was a team of twelve alien thralls under the command of two acolytes. Both of the cultists were keeping their own weapons pointed at the thralls, making sure their orders would be obeyed. Moving swiftly, Corder drew her laser pistol and opened fire on the acolytes. Both of the enemy leaders crumpled to the ground, causing the progeny thralls to stop and look around at the corpses. We're not your enemy, Corder shouted at the thralls, directing her voice at a young Lavakian. Just get out of here! After a moment's hesitation, the young aliens withdrew into the darkness, taking their weapons with them. Seconds later, there was an eruption of gunfire as the now liberated aliens started shooting at their former masters. Maui gave Quarter a thumbs up and then tapped his smart glasses. I'm going to tap into progeny comms, Maui said. See if I can find any more of those acolytes. We need all the confusion we can get. The Stormbreakers started to push forward. Under Maui's guidance, the team bounded from one progeny squad to the next as they proved to be much easier targets than UN soldiers. Meanwhile, it was past midnight and the moon was nearly full, so the battlefield was very brightly lit. Bounding from one piece of wreckage to the next, Nainu was trying to avoid the moonlight, knowing that his own shadow could give him away. When a plasma grenade flew in his direction, Nainu dove inside of an underground drainage pipe for cover, and when he emerged, Nainu realized he had lost his bearings and no longer knew where he was or where he was going. The little lizard gazed around frantically, trying to find his friends. But all he could see were different enemies too busy fighting each other to notice him. Nainu felt his heart sinking as he realized the other Stormbreakers had gone on without him. Feeling lost and abandoned, a sense of despair started weighing Nainu down. Suddenly, he did not want to go on anymore. He should have known this was coming. He was so small and weak and unremarkable. This was inevitable. Of course the others were going to leave him behind. Nainu retreated into the drainage tunnel again, 
where he planned to wait for the fighting to die down before slipping away. Except a gentle fluttering noise somehow made itself heard over the din of battle. Nainu opened his eyes and saw that something was in the tunnel with him. Even in the low light, Nainu realized he was looking at a particularly large insect with colorful wings. Naturally, Nainu's first reptilian instinct was to catch the insect with his long tongue and eat it. But Nainu found he could not really move. He was mesmerized by this creature, which had splotches of blue and yellow color on its wings that looked like eyes. Nainu racked his brains, trying to remember what this thing was called. Varian had mentioned them a few times before. Then it hit him. This creature was called a butterfly. Flitting around gently in the darkness, the butterfly landed on Nainu's knee. It was mostly blue, with some black and yellow coloring mixed in around the eye spots. As he stared at the butterfly, Nainu started to get a very familiar tingling sensation in his spine. His heart raced as he realized what was causing it. Psionic energy? Nainu whispered to himself. How? He was very confused. He knew he could not be mistaken. He was definitely sensing psionic energy coming from, well, a butterfly. Before he could say or do anything else, the butterfly took flight, soaring out of the drainage tunnel and out of sight. Wait, Nainu called out. Come back. It was no good. The butterfly did not return. But Nainu could see it in the moonlight above, flitting around in circles, waiting for him. Realizing what he needed to do, Nainu took a deep breath and clenched his fists. Quarter returned to the spot where she had last seen Nainu, holding her rifle in one hand and a pistol in the other. She gunned down a UN soldier and then cried out for Nainu. Mockingbird! Quarter yelled Nainu's call sign. It's me! It's Grace! Where are you? At that moment, Nainu darted out of the nearby drainage tunnel and started scurrying across the battlefield with newfound purpose and direction. He barely even acknowledged Quarter as he sped along an overgrown sidewalk and across the Blackwell courtyard. Quarter spotted him and gave chase. Where the hell are you going? Quarter yelled. I'm following that butterfly, Nainu replied, pointing at a spot some 20 feet in front of him. What butterfly? Quarter replied. I don't see anything. Quarter had no time to look for anything like that. The battle was still raging all around, and Quarter had to keep her rifle at the low ready, engaging any hostiles who appeared in Nainu's path. One by one, the other Stormbreakers rejoined the group. I found Mockingbird, Quarter reported, but something's wrong. He, he says he's following a butterfly. A what? Varian replied. How the hell would there be any animals around in the middle of a firefight? Nainu led the team to the outer limits of the UN base, which was engulfed in smoke. The progeny had breached the walls and were sacking the place. Setla could see over top of the walls and spot the upper half of Tobanga Totem. The ancient landmark was on fire and would not be there for much longer. UN soldiers were fighting with progeny troops at a gap in the nearby trees, which marked the beginning of Tobanga Trail. That's where we need to go, Nainu shouted. He had crawled on top of Setla's head and was pointing at the trail. The butterfly and the deer are waiting for us. What the hell are you talking about? Setla replied. I don't see any animals over there. Varian's eyes went wide with understanding. Mockingbird, are you sensing psionic energy right now? Nainu looked down at Varian and nodded. Then he jumped down from Setla's shoulders. I... I think they might be psionic life forms, just like the ones that appeared during the War in Heaven, he said. Charging into a fight because my teammate thinks he saw an ethereal, Kingy grumbled, even though they've been extinct for 50 years. Well, I can't think of a better way to die. Let's get this over with. Kingy tried to launch himself into the fight, but Varian held him back. Wait a second, Varian said. 
There's too many blue heads in there. We need the progeny to thin the herd for us. Uplink, what did I say about causing some chaos? Maui reached into his backpack and produced an earpiece. He attached it to his smart glasses and then hunkered down in a bomb crater while he did his work. Holding his headset in one hand, Maui's eyes flickered as they scanned the digital display on his glasses. Finally, he spoke out loud, but he was not addressing any of the Stormbreakers. Aaron Hyatt, this is the Stormbreakers. Listen closely. You just pissed off Scarlet Freeman and attacked UN troops. By this time tomorrow, Berlin's gonna give Freeman a blank check and then turn a blind eye to whatever she does to your little cult. Give us what you've got on Freeman now, and we'll take it from here. There was a pause, punctuated by nearby gunfire and explosions. The UN army had started to push back, and progeny forces were being repelled from the base. When there was no reply, Maui added, Don't play games, Hayat. I know you can hear me. You and your cult won't last a week. Finally, Aaron Hyatt's voice replied, sounding tinny over the little speaker. Neither will you, Stormbreaker. Hyatt, you ever hear the expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? You'll find the saying goes both ways, Hyatt replied. Do you really think you can face down the UN, the Stormbreakers, and the Galactic Community all at once? Do us a favor, and we might let someone else have the honor of killing you. Hyatt's reply came quickly. Freeman is siphoning resources off Operation Prometheus for a personal project. If she gets to the end of Tobanga Trail first, she will take the psionic power source to her laboratory. The UN will never see it again. You can find her facility in the Apollo building at Kennedy Space Center. Your Kelp friend can do the rest. That's all you get, Stormbreaker. I'll see you in hell. Looking forward to it, Maui replied, because the UN troops are going down the trail right now. This was a lie, but it was exactly what the Stormbreakers needed. The token force of UN soldiers stationed in the base was far stronger than the progeny squads attacking them. But as soon as Maui provoked Hayat, progeny reinforcements were directed to the scene. Thralls, acolytes, and even a sorceress stormed up the road and over the ruined wall to join in the assault. Caught in a hail of gunfire, the last remains of the nearby dormitory building collapsed, creating a screen of dust and smoke over the whole scene. It's now or never, Nainu shouted. Go, go, go! The Stormbreakers leapt out of cover and charged. Amidst the dense cloud of smoke and ash, it was impossible to see anything except vague silhouettes and flashes of gunfire. Nainu led the way while Corder followed close behind, using her powerful sense of smell to track Nainu through the darkness. Maui, Kingi, and Varian held onto Corder's shoulders while Setla rampaged along on his own, using his massive body as a battering ram. Just like the Stormbreakers, the UN soldiers had figured out the key to defeating progeny squads. Acolytes were being targeted almost exclusively, which led to dozens of aliens being left out of control. The battle was no longer a three-way firefight, but a chaotic free-for-all with no discernible lines. Then, looming out of the darkness, the Tobanga Totem was in front of the Stormbreakers. The ornate wooden totem was now completely engulfed in flames. A carved eagle at the top seemed to point the way with its one remaining wing. Pushing on through the smoke and darkness, the Stormbreakers gunned down several more enemies before they finally reached Tobanga Trail itself. In the darkness, the trail looked like a portal into some kind of nightmare realm. It was a simple dirt path that wound through the dense pine forest before twisting out of sight. On each side above the trail, the forest grew so densely that a canopy of tree limbs completely obscured the skies above. Once they were on the trail, darkness and silence would press in on all sides until the sun rose. There they go, Nainu called out. The butterfly and the deer are moving down the trail together. We must follow. All five of the Stormbreakers 
peered down the path and saw nothing except for darkness. There are no animals, Setla said. I don't see anything, Varian added. I can't smell anything either, Quarter finished. Maui adjusted his smart glasses and scanned the trail ahead. We can check his eyes later, Maui said. I can see four progeny moving further ahead on the trail and a few UN troops ahead of them. We've got to move, they're leaving us behind. What started as a battle suddenly turned into a chase. Furthest along the trail was Yasin Ackerman, the UN agent who worked for Scarlet Freeman. Three soldiers who used the flashlights on their rifles to light the way were escorting him. After the first group, Aaron Hyatt was jogging at a pace most elderly humans would be incapable of. Two acolytes and a sorceress were keeping pace with her. Finally, the Stormbreakers brought up the rear. Corder was in the lead, and she was letting her Labakian side take over again, running on all fours and looking much more like a lioness than a human. Nainu rode on top of Setla's shoulders again, where he had a commanding view of the bizarre scene. Far ahead along the path, the mysterious blue butterfly was still flying down the Tobanga Trail, but a second creature had joined it. A doe was leaping through the forest alongside the butterfly, and the pair were somehow managing to keep pace with one another. Yet for some reason, Nainu was the only person who could see them. A running gunfight developed. Pistols were fired wildly over shoulders by fleeing progeny and UN troops, while Maui unfolded a laser Sten gun and brought it to bear. Above the chattering noise of Maui's SMG, Hayat could be heard shrieking, Jericho, patron, defender of humankind, your most loyal disciples need your aid. Come to us, come to us and smite the aliens who would have your work undone. A powerful chill ran up Nainu's spine. He knew it well. It was the same agitating sensation he went through whenever the false Jericho appeared. He raised his voice and called out to the other Stormbreakers. Hayat's trying to summon the fake Jericho. Someone chase her down. Kingi, Varian, and Maui all raised their pistols and started firing through the dense trees, trying to hit the cult leader as she rounded a curve in the path. Laser beams and plasma bolts flickered between the trunks, and a moment later, there was a great crash. A tall and ancient tree fell to the ground in an explosion of wooden shrapnel, coming to rest on the Tobanga Trail itself, just in front of the UN soldiers. Yasin Ackerman and his companions reached the fallen tree and hesitated, pausing for just a moment too long. The Stormbreakers caught up and overtook them. A desperate fight broke out in the darkness, illuminated by momentary blasts of laser fire. Nainu gripped onto Setla's body and hung on for dear life as the Mycor grabbed someone and threw him into the trees. After just a moment, the fighting was over. Is that all of them? Varian panted. Did we lose any of our own? None of the Stormbreakers were hurt, but most alarmingly of all, they could not account for all of the UN troops. Where's that slime ball, Ackerman? Kingi asked. I saw him, but then I lost him. No time, Nainu cut in. We're losing Hyatt. By now, Aaron Hyatt and the progeny were very far away. To make matters worse, the moonlight was barely able to filter through the dense canopy above. The darkness was almost complete, and the Stormbreakers were having trouble finding the trail again. After fumbling about in the dark for way too long, Nainu spotted the blue butterfly and its doe companion. There! Nainu yelled. He jumped off Setla's back and started to run down the path. Follow me! This time, the Stormbreakers did not protest. The other five had finally accepted that Nainu was seeing something they could not, and had resolved to put their faith in their little friend. Nainu was also relying on faith, but in a different way. In this moment of incredible desperation, with their quarry so far ahead, Nainu found himself muttering a silent prayer as he chased the butterfly and the doe. Please, help us reach the end of the trail first, or at least keep our enemies from seizing whatever's at the end of this road. Like all members of his own species, Nainu believed that his home planet, Kelta, was a divine object. 
Instinctively, he was begging his homeworld for help. But in the back of his mind, he knew that there was very little Kelta could have done for him in that moment. It was almost 30,000 light years away. In a moment of pure panic, of despairing hope, Nainu redirected his request at the world under his feet. Please, Nainu begged, help us. There was a flash of blinding white light, followed by the ear-splitting crack of thunder. A bolt of lightning had just struck somewhere close by. Against the sudden illumination, Nainu could see the doe and butterfly again. They were still on the path leading the way. Nainu followed the two creatures, and the Stormbreakers followed Nainu. As they pressed on, a powerful wind started blowing towards the team. With great creaks and rustling, the trees started to sway and whistle as air raced through at high speed. Is the sun coming up already? Quarter asked. Look over there! Through the trees, in the same direction the wind was coming from, there was a bright orange glow. It was still too dark to see anyone's faces, but Varian's voice carried the note of urgency. Guys, he or she said, the sun doesn't rise in the north. That's a wildfire. The Stormbreakers began to run. Somebody grabbed Nainu off the ground and he suddenly found himself riding on Quarter's back. Going back was not an option. There were too many soldiers at the trailhead, and the forest was so dense that running in there at night during a wildfire was a death wish. The only option was to press forward along the Tobanga Trail. With each passing minute, the wildfire drew closer and closer. The air began to warm up, light filtered through the trees, and soon the Tobanga Trail was illuminated as though it were daytime. That fire is close, Quarter screamed. We've got to get off the trail and find somewhere to hide. You can't hide from a forest fire, Varian shouted. We'll get cooked alive if we stay in place. Just run, stay on the trail. The treetops were filling with smoke. An acrid taste in the air told Nainu the fire was now very, very close at hand. Perhaps it was due to adrenaline or fear or something else, but none of the Stormbreakers seemed to be aware of the rapidly building heat. All around them, leaves started to spontaneously combust as the wildfire drew closer and closer. A powerful gust of wind sent smoke and embers across the trail. Then the team turned a corner and came upon something unexpected. The ground suddenly sloped downwards into a valley. The trail could actually be seen on the far side, where it ascended halfway up a rocky mountain before stopping at the mouth of a cave. Nainu let out a cry of joy. He could see the blue butterfly flying across the valley. Skimming the treetops, it was aiming directly for the cave. Nainu slid off Quarter's back and looked down into the valley. He could see the mysterious doe running along the path below. Nainu tried to run to follow the doe, but Kingi grabbed him. Do you not see that? Kingi roared. Then. Nainu finally noticed the reason he was able to see clear across the valley in the middle of the night. A forest fire was burning a path of destruction straight through the middle of the valley. The wall of flames stood as tall as the trees and blocked the Tobanga Trail completely. Intense winds blew the flames about, spreading embers and kindling new fires elsewhere in the forest. It was plainly clear to all that in a matter of minutes, the entire forest would be swept up in the inferno. And down in the valley, the Stormbreakers could make out the silhouettes of four people. Erin Hyatt and her fellow progeny were searching for a way to get through the wildfire and reach the cave. For the moment, however, they were completely stuck. Nainu watched as the doe, unseen by the progeny, ran into the fire and emerged on the other side. Clear of the flames, the doe turned its head to look at Nainu and began to stamp its hooves as though it was impatient. Nainu understood the message. We have to go through, he said. Have you completely lost your mind? Varian replied. Nainu, that is a wildfire. 
If we go in there, we will die. My scanner says it's almost 500 degrees Celsius in there, Maui added. We won't be able to get close. Nainu stood his ground. He had already come so far, and for the first time, he was feeling confident in his ability to read and understand the psionic energy around him. He knew he would not be harmed by the fire, but Nainu had no way to prove this to his friends. All right then, Nainu said, but the butterfly and the doe still want me to follow them. If you don't want to follow me, I'll accept that. I'll go alone. Maui, Varian, and Kingi all gave one another nervous looks. Quarter rolled her eyes. You're not going anywhere alone, Nainu, she said. You climb on up and we'll go together. And me, said Laboo. I won't leave a brother reptile to the flames that easy. Realizing they had no choice, Varian, Kingi, and Maui relented. We're going to stay right on your trail, Varian said to Quarter once Nainu got onto her shoulders. You move fast and don't stop for anything. The Stormbreakers took one last moment to gather themselves up, and then they burst into a desperate run. Charging downhill and into the valley, they felt hot air and choking smoke rise up to meet them. Then they were in the thick of the fire. Each step through the undergrowth sent sparks and embers flying. Varian's eyes were watering so badly that she, or he, had to grab and hold onto Quarter's tail to avoid getting lost. Nainu sat up on Quarter's shoulders, keeping an eye on the trail, which was now badly strewn with burning debris. Twice he had to correct Quarter's course, and he knew he was on the right path when, just over a rocky ridgeline, they spotted Aaron Hyatt and her followers. The cult leader had given up on trying to advance through the wildfire and was now just looking for a way to survive. When the Stormbreakers drew level with Hyatt, she panicked and tried to run away, putting her followers between herself and the oncoming fighters. It was so hot here in the middle of the fire that nobody could touch their weapons. Instead, Maui and Kingi both shoved the Acolytes and the Sorceress to the ground while Varian lashed out punching Hyatt in the head. As she crumpled to the ground, Hyatt screamed, Jericho, save me! The Stormbreakers pressed on. The fire was now so intense that flames were licking everyone's legs. Quarter jumped over a flaming bush before Setla simply smashed his way through it. Then the ground began to slope upward. The air was getting cooler. Nainu cheered, we made it! The Tobanga Trail ran up through a charred ruin that was, just a few hours ago, a vibrant pine forest. Now the trees were barren and black. A horrible crunching sound came from underfoot as the team moved along. Getting a sense that they were clear of the danger, everyone slowed down to catch their breath. Panting, Quarter collapsed to the ground, dropping Nainu as she went. That, Quarter gasped was intense. All of the Stormbreakers cheered at their own success, all except Varian, who had a dawning look of realization on his or her face. Hey, Nainu, Varian said, were you sensing psionic energy at all during all of that? Nainu nodded the whole time. Varian's eyes went wide. Then he, or she, turned around and started walking towards a nearby tree. It was still on fire and dropping hot embers as though they were autumn leaves. Before anyone could object, Varian reached out and grabbed the tree trunk, putting their entire hand and wrist into the flames and pressing their palm against the hot embers. Varian, what are you doing? Quarter screamed. It's not real, Varian muttered. Fire's not real. The whole thing's fake. As soon as Varian said the words, the illusion was shattered for the other Stormbreakers. Instantly, the forest fire vanished. The air became cool, and down in the valley, 
the Stormbreakers could see that Hyatt and her followers were still trapped in the illusion of a wildfire. They cried out for Jericho to save them from a non-existent threat, and one of the acolytes waved his arms about as though his clothes were on fire. I think, Setla said, I think we have all been the victims of a telepathic attack. So, this is the power of psionics, Maui breathed. What Jericho could do, what the paradox can do. And were we really planning to just shoot her? When we find the paradox, we'll have to take her by surprise, Quarter said. There's no way we can kill her face to face if she can do things like this. Rattled, but still full of resolve, the Stormbreakers gathered themselves up and followed the Tobanga Trail to the cave entrance. The team peered inside and realized that this was no ordinary cave, but a tunnel leading deep underneath the mountain. I don't want to go in there, Maui said. Bad things always happen underground. But Nainu put any hesitation to rest when he spotted the blue butterfly making its way through the dark cavern ahead. Taking a deep breath, Nainu entered the tunnel and the Stormbreakers followed. Maui entered the cave last, using his headset to transmit a message, knowing it would not function where he was going. June 30th, 2086. Nintao Gate, Galactic Rim. This region of space was the outermost edge of the galaxy. Looking in one direction, there was nothing but empty blackness, as though nothing existed beyond the galactic rim. In the opposite direction, the entirety of the galactic disk could be seen, brilliant and overwhelming. There were only a few stars out here, and vast gulfs of open space between them. Out here in the expansive sea of darkness, there was a hyperspace gate. Built by the progenitors, this ancient megastructure was nearly impossible to see in the low light. But for the briefest moment, the gateway was illuminated as a quantum waveform opened nearby and deposited a starship. The frenzied claw, a frigate in the Galactic Defense Force, drifted quietly away from Nintao Gate while her crew tried to figure out exactly where they were. Furthest from the core, furthest from the core, the Cybon sang. Where we go, we'll see the stars no more. On the bridge, a group of Cybon sang merrily to themselves as they worked on the sensors manager. Standing behind and looking over their shoulders, Erebic, Captain Rustami, Levir Paktu, and Eyes of Red worked together to process the intel as it came in. Was the Oracle able to trace the anomalous signal? Irabig asked. I think we have it, Eyes of Red replied. The Oracle has identified this system as one of extreme significance. With the captain's permission, we'll start scanning for artificial structures. Irabig looked at Captain Rastami and nodded. Start by searching for anything that could have been made by the progenitors, Irabig said. It seems logical that their technology would be capable of broadcasting the ghost signal. Lavir folded his arms. Irabic, have you considered the reports from the Lavakian Sentry Array? He asked. You're referring to the theory that an uncontacted space nation is hiding in this region, Irabic said. I've thought about it, and I do believe they exist, but I also believe they are not the ones broadcasting the ghost signal. The frenzied claw began to start a search pattern. Irabic and her companions were expecting this process to take several days, if not weeks. However, they had a result in mere moments. The sensors manager suddenly lit up. Alarms filled the bridge, and Captain Rastami ordered the crew to their battle stations. 
Irubik, Levere, and Eyes of Red all asked what was going on. We've detected a battle, Captain Rastami explained. There's a fight happening very close by, only about 50 billion kilometers away. In space, distances like this were considered short. Irubik joined her companions at the sensors manager, and they all looked at the situation. This is what they saw. A fleet of starships, numbering in the thousands, was attacking a megalith. Megalith is a catch-all term used by most of the galactic community to describe a gigantic space installation, far too big to be called a space station. There were countless megaliths around the galaxy, most of which were left behind by the old progenitors, such as the Eye of Iran, Tannis Base, the Great Forge at Karos, Balcora Gate, and others. However, the megalith being assaulted by the unknown fleet was not one Arabic recognized. It was a ring. Someone had constructed a ring-like structure that encircled a small blue star. From this distance, the sensors could tell that this mega-sized ring had a diameter of nearly 300 million kilometers. The attacking fleet consisted mostly of super capital ships, and they were raining fire down on the ring structure. Sensors, scan for life signs, Captain Rustami ordered. I need to know if this is the uncontacted civilization. A few moments went by as the frenzied claw carried out her scans. Then, one of the crew members reported back. Sir, I'm getting a reading I don't understand. There are no life signs. Anywhere. No organic life on the ring, and there's nobody on board those attacking ships either. Erebic, Rustami, Eyes of Red, and Levere all looked at one another in shock. We need to know more about this, Erebic said. Levere, bring the Oracle online. Captain Rastami stepped to one side and allowed Levere to punch a series of commands into the ship's computer, bringing the Oracle back up to full power. Once more, the crew of the Frenzied Claw had access to the ancient knowledge of the Progenitor Empire. The Oracle connected itself to the sensors manager and then updated the display data to reflect everything the progenitors knew about the ring and its attackers. Irubik felt her beak go dry as she started to read the new data aloud. The megalith below is called Cybrex Alpha. It is the central core of a machine civilization called the Cybrex, who once waged war against the progenitors. A machine civilization? Lavere repeated. You mean like a society of robots? That's not possible. There's more, Irubik breathed, her voice filling with horror. The attacking fleet belongs to the Batera, another race of machines. The Oracle describes both Cybrex and Batera as an existential threat to the Progenitor Empire and it has records of multiple wars and conflicts pitting the progenitors against one or both of these races. Irubik continued reading aloud, seemingly unaware of the horrified silence now filling the bridge. The Batera are classified by the progenitors as a rogue defense system. The Oracle just says, born in fire, the machine intelligence's first move was to annihilate its organic creators in self-defense. Meanwhile, the battle between Batera and Cybrex continued to play out on the sensor manager. As everyone watched, it became increasingly apparent that something was amiss. They're not putting up a fight, Eyes of Red commented. The Cybrex are not resisting at all. Why? We may have to answer that question later, Captain Rastami said. We've got company. Two Batera warships had broken off from the main battle and were closing on the frenzied claw. On Rastami's orders, the GDF frigate turned and fled, making the best possible speed for the Nintao gate. Meanwhile, Irubik seized control of the sensor array. 
she scanned the incoming Batera warships, determined to gather as much useful data as possible. In a moment of clarity that would only become relevant later on, she stored this data inside of the Oracle rather than the ship's onboard computer. She only looked up from her work when Eyes of Red shouted, Don't use the gate! They might follow us! Paktu, jump us somewhere we can find a GDF fleet! They'll know what to do! Thinking quickly, Lavere punched a set of coordinates into the hyperspace computer. Coordinates are set, Lavere answered. Everyone get to a hyperspace shelter. We're jumping. Irubik followed the crew to the nearest lead-lined shelter and sealed the door behind her. With an all too familiar humming sound, the quantum wave front swept backwards across the frenzied claw, plunging her into hyperspace. Sometime later, the all clear was sounded and the crew emerged. Irubik was the last to return to the bridge, needing a moment to get her thoughts straight and process everything that just happened. She decided that she needed to get off the ship and speak to her fellow members of the Galactic Council. She also made a plan for taking the Oracle with her. Stepping back onto the bridge, Irubik spoke to the captain while he was looking over the sensor manager. Sir, these discoveries are going to have major implications. I need you to return me to the Angel Moon at the earliest possible time and... Captain Rustami, are you listening to me? He was not. Just like everyone else on the bridge, Rustami was looking out the window at a scene taking place just in front of the frenzied claw. Irubik saw what was going on and froze. The ship had rematerialized in the center of a battle. The frenzied claw was in high orbit above the planet Amadio, where an armada of GDF warships were throwing themselves into a desperate final stand against an advancing fleet of human warships. In the center of the enemy formation were two super capital ships, the UNS Charlemagne and a strange looking cruiser of a class and type Irubik had never seen before. Irubik had just enough time to look at the sensors to see that this unknown vessel was ID'd as the UNS Solaris before she and the rest of the crew realized they were staring down the barrel of a very big gun. The Solaris was preparing to attack Amadio with a colossal weapon, and Frenzied Claw was in the line of fire.